So we can continue uh, to think about and contemplate what is going on in Robert's mind as he witnesses. Um, he's acting like uh, he's in this sort of position of a voyeur, right? So he's witnessing this act. They don't know that he's watching. Um, and he is uh, looking through this peephole and um, observing these two people uh, engaged in a sort of sexual exchange uh, that's being described um, in animalistic terms as a rider and a horse. And this is causing Robert uh, to have this kind of panic attack. And a lot of different critics of this uh, story, so people who have written about um, the wars have tried to understand this moment of the novel, and it's understood in a lot of different ways. Um, so for instance, one writer, Heather Anderson, or Heather Sanderson, um, she describes this moment as evidence that Robert is suffering from a kind of homosexual panic. And uh, this is kind of his reaction to, um, or his reaction of kind of violence outburst uh, occurs as part of his kind of refusal to admit that he also has uh, homosexual desires. Um, so he acts out in a violent way because he can't fully process the idea that he also maybe has some of these sexual urges. Um, he just hasn't acted on them yet. Uh, so it's hard for him to sort of process that in a rational way. So it just comes out as kind of anger. So that's how that critic looked at it. And then other critics have um, just understood it as um, a moment of complete being completely baffled, right? He's just frustrated and baffled by something he can't understand and he's confused over. Uh, so this is a description by a critic named Shane Rhodes who interprets Robert's panic as a reaction of vehement and baffled disavowal. So pretty much that's just saying that Robert is can't sort of process psychologically what Taffler and the male prostitute, the Swede, are doing to one another and this confusion causes Robert to kind of uh, lash out um, and his failure to sort of understand this moment comes out as a kind of stammer. So we'll look specifically at the passage at the bottom of page 40 where Robert reacts in this uh, kind of act of confusion and violence. Uh, so Robert's heart was beating so fast he thought it would explode. Even when he looked away and Ella took his place again, he went on hearing and seeing everything he'd heard and seen in his mind. And his mind began to stammer the way it did whenever it was challenged by something it could not accept. He walked across the room and sat on the bed. He picked up a boot and held it in his hand. Its weight alarmed him, and the texture of its leather skin appalled him with its human feel. He threw the boot across the room and shattered the mirror. Then he threw the other boot and broke the water jug. Um, this is him trying to process the information, and then it's revealed that the man being ridden was Taffler. The rider was the Swede, Goliath. So we have a kind of conflation between all these different ideas in that, um, in what Robert has been witnessing. And I think his reaction is kind of interesting, the fact that he picks up a boot and it's the feel of the leather that feels like human, the human feel of leather, so an animal product, leather is, you know, cowhide, um, and it feels human, this is something that, uh, Repel, repels Robert or confuses him and then he throws it and hits the mirror. So the fact that he's hitting a mirror could also be very symbolic of his own sense of identity at this point. A mirror is where you are, your reflection is reflected back to you. So perhaps he's seeing something in Taffler, this man who he's admired and wants to look up to and wants to emulate. Um, he sees Taffler engaged in a sexual act with another man and Robert can't fully process um, this moment and perhaps he also identifies somewhat with the uh, desire to also engage in a kind of homosexual um, act. And then that description of the scene, so the man being ridden was Taffler, so Taffler's kind of in the horse position as well 
in this sexual uh, exchange. Um, so that could also be significant. I think the novel kind of develops this idea that a horse is kind of a symbol for male sexuality in the novel. Uh, it's kind of uh, a symbol of strength and power and as we'll see Robert becomes more and more sort of aligned with horses uh, the longer the novel goes on and the horse is kind of a representation of um, Robert in particular but also a kind of version of male sexuality I think that's that the Finley in the novel is kind of uh, reiterating and uh, Goliath so a call back to that prior scene that we talked about the David and Goliath um, metaphor that Taffler used to describe the war one David after another and here was Goliath is the male prostitute that he um, is engaged in this sexual exchange with so it's a confusing episode to say the least and Robert is baffled angry confused um, possibly mixed in there is some sort of underlying desire that he has uh, so it is a flood of emotions all at once and he can't quite process them and it results in this um, him taking that boot crashing it against the mirror and causing a big sort of uh, you know kerfuffle at the brothel so this was not a sort of uh, smooth experience in terms of his first sexual episode. Uh, it was a traumatic moment for young Robert uh, with his innocence being sort of destroyed in this moment and his ideal of masculinity, Taffler, being sort of taken off his pedestal uh, in a kind of really traumatic, startling way. So it's Robert kind of awakening to some... Uh, realities about himself and uh, masculinity and sexuality that he maybe had never considered until this point. So uh, Robert uh, is promoted to second lieutenant. This is on page 42 and it says at the bottom of page 42 he was now a fully commissioned officer and ripe for the wars. So they were going to send them all overseas, and they're going to take this um, ship uh, with all the soldiers, as well as the horses being sort of crammed together in the SS Masanabi. So it's this tiered um, ship, and the horses are placed in uh, like cargo at the bottom hold and uh, Robert describes how the horses were being brought aboard each horse was lifted in a harness by a gigantic crane and lowered into the hold like cargo so this is kind of an indication of how horses were treated during the war they were treated just like cargo right it was like as if it was a box or an object or a tool something that wasn't living um, so they were treated very much like an expendable object uh, to be used and discarded and uh, at this point um, each horse uh, is put aboard the ship and uh, that idea of how there's a kind of a parallel being created between the men and the horses uh, the soldiers and the horses um, is evident uh, as we see how the horses are mistreated and um, there is sort of chaos aboard the ship. So all the men are also uh, sort of crammed into this giant ship and this is the sort of an illustration of the SS or a photograph of the SS uh, Masanabi. Um, so there would be different levels and each level was kind of um, a home for different the different sort of hierarchies of the military so if you were a lieutenant you had more space than if you were just um, one of the infantry and then it describes how there was a storm going on and there was problems with 
uh, disorder and the inhumane sort of treatment of the men uh, resulted in them acting out and becoming violent. Uh, so this is described on page 51. Uh, the storm that raged was real and it wreaked havoc in every quarter of the ship. The men whose discipline was tenuous to begin with were cramped into spaces meant to hold a quarter of their number. They fought and argued from one side of the ocean to the other. The food was always stew and very often stew with curry in it to mask its true flavor. 240 men sat down together feeding from plank top tables that had foolishly been set on trestles. So there was a good deal of fighting and uh, many of the men had been never been to sea before so they would be seasick and it was it's described as pretty much a sort of chaotic uh, scene on top of page 52. Few of the men had ever been to sea and although they weren't tolerably used to the crowding of their barracks, although they were tolerably used to the crowding of their barracks, nothing had prepared them for the airless jamming of their quarters under decks. The makeshift latrines and showers were virtually open forums where privacy was unheard of. Men unable to find a space at the trough-like urinals simply turned aside and aimed at the bulkheads. Portholes were closed and locked against the cold. The air was blue with smoke, and this, plus the tremendous heat from the boilers, drew off the oxygen. Everyone suffered from headaches, and men who lived outdoors all their lives passed out because they couldn't breathe. Um, further down, nothing had been thought of to entertain the men, and so there was a good deal of fighting most of it having to do with cheating at cards and sexual bullying. Um, but Robert is in the first class accommodations where the officers had it a little better off. Um, so they still had it um, a little better in terms of privacy and private quarters. Uh, but the men below decks are uh, crammed in there and just that description of like trough like urinals it again connotes a kind of animalistic um, scene so Finley is always sort of making this parallel between how the men are treated like animals and here we have that instance of the horses being crammed into the um, cargo load uh, is kind of a re reflection of how this military system also treats the soldiers um, as if they were expendable tools uh, they're just crammed in there. They're no longer men, right? They're just soldiers, and they're there to do their duty for their country, and individual personalities, individuality doesn't really matter. So there's kind of this dehumanization of uh, the soldiers. And the one thing that Robert has that some of the other men do not is the fact that he is wearing a weapon, and this identifies him as a senior officer. On page 53, wearing a holster gave you the ritual edge and authority even in spite of their training and weeks spent establishing their rank through punishing drills and endless parades. The officers were very young and most of them were slimly built compared to the veterans of lumber camps and railroad gangs. In the end, it was only their mutual obedience to some intrinsic tyranny, or tyranny that held the men and officers in check apart. So... Uh, we've talked about hierarchies before uh, when we were talking about Shawshank Redemption, but the military system is also similarly uh, hierarchical in structure. And there's this, what uh, Finley calls the intrinsic tyranny uh, that is set up in order to separate senior uh, officers from um, the rest of the men. Um, and it's uh, often just those who have weapons are the ones who are in control. So if you didn't have a weapon, you were uh, potentially uh, could be victimized. Um, but there is supposed to be a sense of very strict order and um, in terms of ranking in the military system. So Robert as lieutenant, he has a gun and uh, has some sense of authority over the other men. But there is a clear, again, stratification of uh, military positions in ranking between senior officers and the uh, sort of uh, lower infantry 